Hello and welcome to the Lens at 177 and with the first year anniversary approaching for the coalition government. Today we begin a series of interviews with the key leaders in this coalition government and sitting down with me today is the uh, Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Finance, Professor Biman Prasad, leader of the National Federation Party, a coalition partner. Uh, Professor Prasad, thank you for joining us. Uh, as we go towards the uh, first year in office, uh, what should we consider as the major economic achievements uh, of this government? Well, a uh, couple of things, uh, Anish, uh, because it links, it, it is uh, intricately linked with the economic performance. Um, people ask me what has changed in a year. A lot has changed. Uh, the practice of democracy has changed. There is a sense of freedom, there is a sense of confidence, and a little bit of exuberance on the part of generally the people, the investors. And that uh, has fed very well into the economic performance. Because in any country, when you don't have that kind of confidence, um, you don't create that environment for uh, economic performance. So coming out of COVID, so th this is very important. It has to be said, you know, to link uh, the economic performance that we have achieved mm -hmm. in 2023. In 2019, the economy had contracted, we had negative growth. When we went into COVID, we had a deep contraction. We had the fourth largest contraction of all the economies in the world. And so 2022 growth was essentially coming from down there and recovering. So the growth in 2022 that we had was recovery. 2023, we can see the different sectors. So beginning with tourism, by the end of this year, we will have tourist numbers 4% more than 2019. Mm -hmm. So what that means is now in 2023, we are seeing real growth. Coupled with the big recovery in tourism and growth, uh, we see uh, recovery in other sectors, uh, you know, the services sector, the consumption, uh, remittances are also helping. Uh, we are projecting about $1.2 billion in remittances. Uh, there is a number of investment projects that have started. And so we started with uh, a growth rate of around 6%. That's been revised to 8%. Now it's been revised further upwards to 8.2 percent so essentially if if i answer your question uh, in one sentence mm. we have been achieving a lot of uh, good uh, growth mm. uh, you know supported by different sectors of the economy there are sectors which still need um, uh, to perform better agriculture resource sectors and if you look at the budget, you know, we have focused a little bit mm. on some of those sectors because we believe that while tourism uh, gives us 40% of GDP, the other 60% comes from other sectors. And for us to uh, grow the economy in a sustainable way, we will need to look at other sectors. So that's the broad um, uh, scenario in terms of the economic performance. Mm. And I'm very pleased with it. Mm. There, uh, 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 you haven't been tested uh, with a COVID-like pandemic, uh, no natural disaster. Uh, it has been smooth sailing for this government. Would you agree that your government or this government hasn't been tested in the way the previous government went through uh, natural disasters and COVID? It's not about uh, being tested. Uh, it's about uh, getting the government machinery. So, for example, you know, when we were expecting this recent cyclone, uh, I was uh, acting Prime Minister and I saw uh, the preparedness uh, from the Minister for uh, National Disaster Management, Minister responsible for National Disaster Management. It was a perfect mm. uh, you know, preparation. And if we were going to be hit by that cyclone, we were actually ready uh, to respond in a way that would have been very effective. So. Um, as a government, you know, we are very mindful. I mean, we, we experience it. We know what happened previously, whether it's natural disasters, pandemic, and any government, you know, uh, 
uh, if, if what it's sold, you know, would, would uh, always be prepared and factor these things into uh, the economic policies, uh, budgetary provisions. And we, we've done that in, in the budget as well. Mm -hmm. But if it is a pandemic, you know, if it is a disaster which goes beyond, you know, the preparedness, um, then that is something uh, that would be unnatural and that would have to be dealt with at the time that it happens. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned the economic growth forecast. Uh, they are all uh, single-digit growths. In the next uh, three years, uh, do you want to see a double-digit growth? Well, if yes, uh, what uh, factors will play? I, I think if you look at the, the ideally, you know, yes. I mean, because we've had uh, not unprecedented. We were told we had unprecedented growth. But we had essentially a very modest growth rate over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, and that growth, Anish, came from what I call budo economics, mm -hmm. borrowing, spending, I was not quality expenditure. So yes, you know, uh, any uh, growth uh, of 2 to 3% uh, or, or around that, that figure would be growth that would be natural. What is likely to happen next year? And this is why we are projecting a slightly lower growth in 2024 and 2025. But I'm hoping that our tourism capacity, our agriculture sector, some of the new industries such as those in the BPO sector, services sector, uh, you know, renewed consumption, uh, interest rate has been holding very well. Mm. Uh, the housing sector. Will, so if we have those variables, those sectors performing well, then we may be able to achieve uh, higher growth uh, in 2024-25. But it all depends on partly on what happens internationally, mm. what happens to our tourism uh, market. In fact, the tourism uh, capacity is almost like full. We need 5,000 additional re uh, rooms. Uh, the, the Minister responsible for tourism, DPM Goboka, I'm sure will will uh, tell you more on that. But uh, that's how uh, we we uh, are looking at. And you have to remember, Anish, that we inherited a economy. Uh, you know, people say, you know, uh, don't talk about what happened before. When you talk about the present economic performance, you can't de-link it to what happened in the past because a lot of the legacy issues are still impacting on the policies that we are putting in. For example, you know, we have this huge debt level that we will talk about, um, you know, uh, when we have time. But addressing that and addressing the big infrastructure deficit also uh, requires us to look at how we can juggle with the resources and the allocation. Sometimes, uh, you know, we may not be, be able to allocate more to agriculture sector because we have to allocate more to the social welfare mm -hmm. because we are still dealing with the transitional effects of COVID and mm -hmm. the poor economic performance before COVID and and uh, how many how people were faring you know in terms of the income and employment. So these are variables that we'll have to take into account to determine what is the kind of uh, growth we will have in 24 and 25. Mm -hmm. But ideally, a double-digit growth. Uh, would be um, would be much better, but we haven't. I mean, if you look at the history of uh, this country, mm. uh, the average growth in the 70s, uh, you know, in the 80s, was higher than compared to what the average growth was in the last, you know, 10, 15 years. Mm. Have you started working on the 24, 25 budget, and uh, what are the key issues you're looking at now? That's a very good question, uh, Anis. Uh, we are very advanced in our planning. Uh, one thing that didn't exist uh, over the last 10, 15 years was the absence of a national planning office. There was essentially no planning, no coordination, no monitoring and evaluation. What we have done is set up a very, very well-resourced, uh, we're hiring more people, we're hiring people uh, in monitoring and evaluation uh, areas as well. So we have a national planning office now, which is going to, which is at the moment, you know, uh, formulating a national development plan, doing, going through the consultation. But the national planning office is very 
important and key to driving mm. the coordination, uh, not only amongst uh, different ministries, but also coordination with our development partners. One of the complaints that we hear from our development partners uh, since I've come in is lack of coordination between different ministries, different departments, uh, and coordination among the donors. So we have now been able to arrest that uh, you know, to a large extent because our planning office is working very, very well. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is how we are, we are managing that. Uh, will your planning office uh, be able to detect wastage and corruption? We, uh, th this is again a very good question. The planning office uh, will be involved in it. In fact, uh, I have already discussed, uh, you know, and I can reveal this to you, mm. uh, that we are going to have uh, what I call a program called Value for Money. Because when we talk about wastage, mismanagement, uh, you know, corruption, sometimes these things are legally done. But when you look at value for money, for example, uh, you know, whether we did a uh, cost-benefit analysis of building this Queen Elizabeth uh, Road, we probably sp spent about you know, 50 to $60 million mm -hmm. there. Was it necessary at this point in time? What was the opportunity cost? What could have been uh, done elsewhere with that money? So these are the sort of analyses and planning and, uh, and uh, uh, evaluation that was not being done. So somebody comes with the idea and says, okay, when we build this because we want to beautify this place. Uh, and and you, you go ahead and do that. When you need to build five uh, you know, health centers, renovate uh, 10 schools, mm. the money could have been uh, used there. Which is, so we have now got a national infrastructure plan. We are going, and the national infrastructure plan uh, has you know, certain requirements how you determine a particular project so that you put money, government money into areas where it is a priority, where it's needed, where it is going to uh, spur economic growth and support other sectors. So we have actually done quite a bit of work in, in, the, in the last uh, uh, six months on the planning office. And um, the plan, we are already thinking about the next budget. Um, you know, process will, will uh, is already, um, in some sense, the thinking is already underway, uh, and we will be, uh, and as I said, you know, we will be revealing these things well before the budget. Mm -hmm. You know, budgets are not supposed to be some uh, state, uh, you know, some secret, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, issue, you know, dropped, you know, from the mouth of the finance minister in, in, in parliament. Uh, we didn't do that last time. And it worked very well. People understood what was coming, and that's what we are going to do. What Fijians want to hear from the mouth of the uh, finance minister is uh, his details on corruption and wasters, the big sharks uh, yeah. who who were there. Uh, why aren't you naming and shaming people? Well, uh, that's uh, not uh, quite true. In fact, if you uh, uh, see what we've done in Parliament, we've actually uh, named people in Parliament. Uh, we've, we've given examples, uh, you know, when I gave that uh, example of the renovation of the former Prime Minister's house, uh, I actually named people. Uh, there are a lot of things, uh, Anish, that, that are there, as I said, you know, which in our view is wastage, uh, abuse, uh, some legally done. Uh, and we also don't want, as a government, uh, you know, to just go on a witch hunt uh, to go after people. I think there are uh, areas where investigations are continuing. Um, the agencies are doing that. Uh, government doesn't want to interfere in, in some of those things. That would not be the right thing to do. But um, yes, I mean, uh, there are people who were responsible uh, sitting in boards, but the, the decisions that were made were made by politicians you know, through phone calls, mm. through, uh, so, you know, you, you could have a decision to build a, a, or renovate a particular, uh, for example, uh, road, or you want to build a hospital in Nronga, and you call for a tender, and you hire uh, an engineer who is a, who is a Fiji-first uh, fundraiser, who sits on commissions and boards, 
and you know who I'm talking about. But the fact is that this is all done legally. We had a CIU, Construction Implementation Unit, uh, you know, which was working somewhere, you know, uh, independently at the direction of the then minister, determining, and then you, you put up a tender, and then you come with the variations. Five variations, six variations, so you start with two million and you end up spending seven million. Mm. So this is how it was done. Uh, and it's not easy to, to um, uh, you know, bring all that out uh, without actually looking at it carefully. So I, I know uh, people's frustration. I know people's expectation uh, that suddenly, you know, this government will come and uh, uh, start naming and shaming. You know, we don't want to do that. We want to do it properly. Uh, we want to uh, practice, uh, you know, uh, good governance. Uh, we are allowing uh, institutions, independent institutions that are responsible uh, for investigation. Uh, our audit office, the Auditor General's office, uh, for example, the um, Govind Park investigation, which I uh, said when I visited that, uh, it's being uh, conducted by the audit office, and uh, we are hoping to get an update on that very soon. So these are uh, areas where we are looking at. Uh, major government projects uh, from other ministries, do they personally go through your desk uh, for approval? If a ministry is wanting to embark on a major project where tax pays don't... No, there are, there are uh, proper processes. Uh, there is a tender board. Uh, you know, we, the, the, I don't, uh, as a minister of finance, I don't decide, you know, who gets what tender. Uh, there are processes that need to be followed. And uh, unlike, you know, some of the practices of the past, uh, we are making sure that uh, the process is followed. Um, what we are emphasizing to the ministers uh, in our monitoring and evaluation of the budget, and when we did the budget, you know, we did it very carefully, not at the whim of a minister. We went through a process where we invited submissions and we said, okay, these are priority areas, this is what the ministry wants to do. And so we keep a tab, mm. uh, you know, in terms of monitoring and evaluation of what uh, government uh, projects are happening because they're already budgeted for. They, they are not doing anything outside of the budget. Mm. So when we present a budget, we actually list. If it is uh, for Ministry of Public Works, it says, okay, you know, if we have to um, uh, provide electricity in this rural area. This is the amount that is allocated. What we are keen to see is how effectively it's done and whether we are doing it uh, with, with uh, in a way where we get value for money. So that, you know, if there is a, a renovation of a health center, we want to make sure that it's done well. Good materials are used properly done so that it lasts uh, and not uh, after two years you know it starts falling apart so those are things that um, uh, is part of this whole program that I want to bring uh, which I would call it value for money program or something you know? mm -hmm. in the time you have been in office have you been offered a bribe to do no. something do you know of anybody in the government who has been offered a bribe no I don't think so Mr. Prasad, thank you very I can't, much. I can't talk about, uh, uh, you know, what might be happening outside, you know, in, in, in other sectors. But um, crooks don't come to me. Any favors? Anybody came asking for favors? N you retained for something? No. No. Because people know what I am. And so... My position is crooks don't come to me. Professor Prasad, thank you very much. We'll take a break and the discussion continues after this. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. 
Welcome back, uh, Professor Prasad. Let's, uh, let's continue the discussion. Let's talk about the um, employment and unemployment status of the country currently. The program, uh, currently your ministry is undertaking a survey mm -hmm. on uh, uh, em employment and unemployment. Let's tackle unemployment first. Do you accept there is unemployment and what is the government doing about it? Well, uh, Anish, that's uh, again a very good question. You know, transitioning from COVID, 2020-21, uh, 22, uh, it has created two things. Uh, so on one side, we have this big challenge. We lost quite a bit of uh, labor force. In fact, in, in the last uh, almost two years, we lost 10% of the labor force from the uh, former sector. Now, it, it's uh, on one hand, it, you know, it's been a challenge to um, uh, lose people and good skilled people, experienced people. We've lost people from the Ministry of Finance. You know, at, at one point, you know, we were operating on about 60% of the capacity. Uh, but it has also uh, created this positive aspect. So on one hand, we have, there are vacancies being filled. Uh, people are leaving uh, for abroad. Uh, jobs are being filled by others who don't have jobs. Mm -hmm. Other than that, there has also been new jobs created. So tourism industry, as I said, you know, if it is going to be 4% more than uh, 2019, you know, in terms of numbers, in terms of the capacity, and it is, the numbers are showing very strongly that not only there are jobs being replaced, there are new jobs being created. And what has happened as a result of that, that there is shortage of labor in other sectors. So mm. in the tourism industry, what has happened because the demand for labor just peaked and still uh, increasing, mm. the salaries and wages have also gone up. Mm. So there is a movement of people away from other sectors, even people from Suba, you know, moving to uh, the Western Division Nandi and other areas to look for better paying jobs. The Suba retailers uh, president a uh, couple of two months ago said publicly calling for people who are at home mm -hmm. to come and uh, walk. So um, the survey is being done now and I'm confident that what it is showing, in, in fact the FNPF figures show that the salaries and wages in the formal sector mm -hmm. have increased by about 10 to 12 percent. In terms of the total salaries and wages bill, uh, it, it has increased by about 25 percent, you know, compared to say 2019. Mm -hmm. So, based on that statistics, uh, I think uh, the survey, when it comes out, the actual figures, that the unemployment rate would be pretty low, mm -hmm. because uh, we 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 are creating more jobs but also we are filling um, jobs that are being uh, created or vacant positions as a result of people uh, leaving the country. Mm -hmm. uh, we are also uh, making sure that we are training uh, more people. Uh, we provided uh, additional funding for the Pacific Polytech. Mm -hmm. You know, some people criticize that uh, without actually knowing, you know, how important it was. Uh, the government the institutions couldn't provide the training and, and the biggest disaster for this country was what the previous government did in terms of setting up these technical colleges. Mm -hmm. We ended up spending you know more than 20 million dollars and what happened? All of it collapsed, it was lying there, Pacific Polytech came in, rescued some of uh, those you know training institutes. Now they are, I'm told that they have more than 1,000 students, uh, you know, studying and also coming out, you know, in short term, you know, technical skills and directly being employed. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the employment situation, uh, I think, um, uh, from the figures that we've got, you know, from different sectors mm -hmm. uh, is very, very positive. Talking about Pacific Polytech, uh, you haven't spoken about this publicly, but uh, your Mrs. Uh, uh, Mrs. Prasad has been linked 
to people take on social media uh, through yeah. commentary on social media that that's completely uh, false she has nothing to do with the pacific politic mm. uh, she used to be uh, uh, one of the trustees uh, of the global girmit uh, which uh, obviously um, uh, was responsible for organizing the Girmit conference. Uh, and I know uh, there are politicians who jumped on it. Uh, there was nothing untoward about it. Uh, the agreement, uh, the, the Girmit funding was approved by cabinet. That specific mm -hmm. allocation, uh, you know, of $200,000 was for the organization of the Girmit conference, the international conference, and it was one of the best organized conference mm -hmm. and we gave it to people who knew uh, people in that area uh, it was a specialized uh, area and it was one of the best conference the audited report uh, you know um, for the Girmit um, uh, conference uh, has been provided to the Ministry of Finance and uh, it, it's, it's all there so all these um, you know attack uh, on this uh, very uh, innocent, highly qualified woman who stands in her own right mm -hmm. was just pathetic uh, show uh, of, of gutter level politics by those who, you know, who uh, raised it uh, outside of parliament and some irrelevant politicians mm -hmm. too. No? You are also getting a lot of attacks on social media uh, since you've become minister. Uh, have you grown a thick skin or are you bothered by it? Well, you know, uh, somebody asked me about um, these uh, TikToks, you know, uh, people who swear at me and swear at my family and, you know, these are, uh, I, I wouldn't call them cowards. I, I think these are people who get uh, a bit of kick, you know, sitting on the screen, you know, inside the house, uh, being creative, cartoons and all that. So uh, I can understand, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the, uh, the social media things and, and uh, I don't read there, but sometimes people send it to me. I enjoy the cartoons and all that, <laughs> but it doesn't bother me. I mean, uh, I I uh, I I look at you know criticisms that uh, make sense, uh, and as a government, you know, we we uh, have uh, created that environment, a practice of democracy, media freedom, uh, you know, where people are able to say things to government ministers mm -hmm. i don't have any particular ego you know if somebody swears at me anonymously on TikTok and all that you know that's fine i mean that's okay you know if people choose to do that there's nothing i can do but for me uh, and you know in this day and age of social media and uh, politicians can expect that and our opponents sometimes use that as a tool to uh, create uh, i mean all the mischief mm -hmm. before the election and after the election Immediately after the election, all these falsehoods, lies about, you know, people will lose social welfare, people will lose scholarships, uh, there will be, uh, I mean, people are still asking me uh, or telling me mm. what they were told during the election mm. uh, and they, what they are being told now. So our opponents are still uh, spreading mischief. Let me just say this, Anis. I don't worry about all this uh, social media, uh, you know, fake news and all that. But if there are politicians who are deliberately creating, you know, false news, have forgotten about their own past, uh, you know, who are part of the, uh, the uh, destruction that we have in this country today, we will respond to them. We will respond to them pointedly and correctly so that we will do as as a government as as a minister i will do that mm. and uh, but people who create false news uh, yes you know sometimes people believe false news but uh, it doesn't uh, really bother me uh, because i'm not looking at uh, just the next election uh, just like what we saw before mm. i am I've, I've been given a job in this government by the Honourable Prime Minister. I'm a leader of a party in a three-party coalition. W when we are in government, we are working for the country. Mm -hmm. We're working for the people. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm focused on doing. Given the cost of living, uh, the, rise, the rise in cost of living argument currently uh, mm -hmm. in the country, 
will it be a plus on your uh, on your on, on your record that you uh, offer a call adjustment uh, for workers across Fiji by law or by an announcement uh, is that possible uh, so uh, two things Anisha I think this needs to be explained I think there is a lot of mischief and misinformation about uh, the cost of living so if you look at if you compare what has happened around the globe you know in 2023 you know in terms of global economic trends you look at Australia and New Zealand I was talking to um, uh, one of the persons from FBC she interviewed me yesterday and she was in New Zealand she, s she said to me that say you know the cost of living in New Zealand is just mm -hmm. out of the roof and she said it's nothing like what we have here she said so and and, and I think she was right because if you look at couple of variables Anish. Interest rate in Fiji compared to Australia and New Zealand has been kept low. Mm. So that's been an advantage to the, uh, the uh, people, uh, investors, those who uh, are trying to invest in houses and all that. Plus, you know, it, it's holding uh, inflation uh, at, at bay. What has happened in the last budget? So when we did the last budget, we had to do three things. And, and this is linked to cost of living, because that's where a lot of the misinformation is coming. Mm. We had to reform the tech system. We had to make sure that we uh, have a platform to consolidate our fiscal position. Plus, we also had to make sure that we allocate enough resources for the sectors and look after our people. So what we did, there are three rates of VAT. Mm. Zero, 9 and 15. Zero on 21 food items, which was our list in 2018 mm -hmm. election campaign. We said, you know, because VET was 15% during the previous government's time. Then they uh, brought it down to 10%. Then they came up with three rates. Mm -hmm. Zero, 9 and 15. So the VET rate of 15 is a, not a new thing. It was there on a lot of the services and a lot of items. And a lot of revenue was being lost. There was, there was a lot of administrative issues, uh, you know, in terms of compliance, in terms of the actual collection. So we reformed it. We kept the zero rated vet on 21 basic food items. And we added prescribed medicine, 22 items. So if you go to a pharmacy with a prescribed uh, prescription, you don't pay vet, plus all the 21 food items. Then we increased the bet from 9 to 15%. Some unscrupulous traders and wholesalers, and we know some of them just added 15% to the 9% instead of the 6%. And there were some mischief makers there, you know, immediately after the budget was announced. But what you see, and FCCC has come out very well, the critics are not even talking about it. A lot of prices for a lot of food items have actually come down. Some have gone up, I agree, but some of them are linked to what's happening internationally. Mm. You know, wheat prices go up internationally, flour prices will go up here. Fuel prices go up internationally, fuel prices will go up here. But we also made sure that in the budget, we reduced the duties on chicken portion, chicken mm. wings, chicken drumsticks, lamb, beef, pork, and the prices have gone down. There are other factors that are also determining because we kept the interest rate uh, low, the freight cost during COVID had gone up like three or four times and the prices went up. Mm. Some people got used to keeping that price or some uh, businesses, some traders. While the freight cost kept coming down, the prices didn't follow in the same direction in the way that it should have. So we are now, we, when we came into government, we started looking at that. And so some prices, even after the VET has gone up to 15% from nine, from 9 to 15, mm -hmm. another 6% increase, the actual prices have gone down mm -hmm. because the freight cost has come down. So uh, the, the situation uh, is, is not uh, as bad as what our critics um, are, um, are uh, painting it to be like. You know, I was um, uh, in Nakasi on Monday night, you know, with a group of 10, 15 people. Uh, and there was somebody from New Zealand as well. And he was comparing about New Zealand. And I said, look, even with the, with the 
level of wages and salaries in New Zealand, the people are struggling, uh, you know, with the cost of living. And a lot of people were saying that a lot of food items, the prices have actually come down. Mm. So uh, all I want to say to the people uh, is, look, you know, we provided a much bigger bill. But the most important thing that we did in the budget, and this is very important, mm. this is absolutely important point. So all the five to six hundred million that we got from additional uh, taxes, but it's not just VAT. We increase the company tax. We put three percent on on the uh, import of materials and all that. A lot of businesses were complaining. So it's not just, uh, and we didn't increase the income threshold for people earning below thirty thousand. So all of those people are still earning the same take-home pay. Then we made sure that out of that five, six hundred million that we, uh, that additional revenue we got, we put all of them to assist our people. So, social welfare allowance, right across, increased by fifteen or twenty-five percent. Pensioners increased by fifteen percent. The the um, uh, allocation for kidney dialysis. The uh, bus fare assistance and, and uh, subsidy, 100 million. Then we wrote of $650 million, 53,000 families mm. where their ch children were paying debt fortnightly, monthly. That income is now with the family. Mm. So what we have ensured, so when people say if the prices even with zero weight on some of the basic food items, even with the 9% and 15% that was there, mm. these people were still struggling. So people below a certain level of income and those below the poverty line were struggling. Even if we didn't change any tax mm. uh, system, they were still struggling to put food on the table. What we did by increasing 9% from, from 9 to 15 percent, increasing company tax, getting additional revenue, we are now increasing their income. Mm. You, you couldn't do anything with the, with, the, with the price of the goods. What we could do was to raise the income. So all of them have got now more income. Then we realized that the farmers, mm. agriculture farmers, we said we need to support them. We gave subsidies to rice, Dalo, ginger, and cassava farmers. Subsidy on fertilizer and we decide. That's money being saved. Mm. Sugarcane farmers, we realized that the cane payment, last cane payment was going to be very low. Christmas was going to be very bleak for them. We put in additional $8 million, additional $8 million, and gave the highest cane price ever in the history of this country because we recognized that the farmers needed that not only for cost of living, but you know, uh, to support the farming. Then we also realize that, so, so if you look at the budget, it's a very well-crafted, mm. making economic sense, social sense, consolidating our fiscal position, and setting our foundation and breaking away from the Budo economics of borrowing and spending to something more sensible, mm. you know. So we, we've actually, by the budget, we put a very sensible, uh, you know, foundation for economic growth to address uh, issues such as cost of living. So there is there is a lot of misinformation, and, and unfortunately, mm. uh, you know, some politicians uh, are, are playing that as well, uh, but. They're not talking about any of these other uh, provisions that we've made. Mm. The important thing is, e let's say that we, even if we went and, and uh, increased the, the uh, number of food items to zero without changing anything. Mm. But those people, the, those farmers, those uh, on social welfare, those living below poverty line, those students who are paying these tails debt, uh, pensioners, um, people who needed uh, kidney dialysis, we, in we increased the subsidy. How would we have funded that? Then people want 
good water, good road, good hospitals. Look at CWM Hospital, it's much more cleaner now. Look at all the uh, health centers. We've fixed the Kethi Health Center. We've fixed Korobo, Kandavu, Nasori is being fixed now. And these, these, this is funding from the budget. Mm. So overall, we might have put in about a billion dollars into assisting our people. Out of the $4.3 billion budget, one billion and it goes into debt servicing. One billion. Mm. That's what we inherited. So it's been a tough year for, for the government because not only we had to reset the direction of the economic policy, not only we had to break from the, the, the practice of Budo economics, mm. a practice of mismanagement and bad policy making, we also had to manage the expectation of the people because coming out of COVID, coming out of you know, 10 years of you know, uh, dictatorship and economic management that was forced onto the people, people were expecting things to change overnight. We have changed a lot of things overnight. Mm. Given you media freedom, practice of democracy, governance, then in six months we put out a budget that is addressing the fundamental issues. So we've done uh, quite a bit, and uh, in one year, I think a lot has changed mm. for the better. Professor Prasad, thank you very much. Uh, we'll take a short break and return after this. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. Welcome back, uh, Professor Prasad. Uh, thank you for speaking with us. Uh, the f uh, first question in the last segment is, uh, do you have the right people uh, in terms of having the right talent on boards uh, in permanent secretary positions yeah. to drive the government's agenda forward? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a very subjective uh, uh, thing. Uh, for uh, certain boards, for example, uh, when I appoint people on FNPA board or FDB board or Reserve Bank board or EFL board, we have a process. You know, I, I pass those names to the Reserve Bank of Fiji uh, to check some of the uh, fit for purpose. Uh, there are uh, uh, for example, the FNPF Act uh, specifies uh, particular kind of skills that people need to have. Some boards uh, don't have that. Uh, you know, so, so uh, some are very clear. And as far as I'm concerned, the ones uh, uh, that I've appointed, uh, I think they're all very qualified. And what we also have done, Anish, is, you know, we've, we didn't come into government and, and, and just said, we, we're going to remove everybody who was appointed by Fiji first. Mm. Uh, that's not the approach uh, we have taken. I mean, some uh, people were good, uh, some were there, some were following directions. Uh, the civil service uh, is like that. If you look at my uh, finance ministry, um, I didn't change anybody uh, from the Ministry of Finance. Uh, I have a very competent um, uh, permanent secretary. Uh, you know, and and so uh, I, I I I take that view uh, that um, yes, I mean we we may not get the right people all the time. Uh, that's that that is uh, to be understood, and I think uh, there'll always be uh, people who would say that you know somebody is not qualified, or we should have had somebody with this background. So th there is that debate that will uh, carry on, no matter who you appoint. But you're right, uh, having the right people uh, in, the, in the position is very important. Mm. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned, as far as the government is concerned, uh, I think uh, sometimes, you know, even on a board, it's good to have people with different background. Uh, doesn't necessarily have to be somebody who's, uh, say, you know, an accountant, you know, to be on the board of uh, FDB, mm -hmm. for example. 
or an economist to be on the board of FDB. You could have somebody who is, who is, who is uh, a, a good farmer, you know, who understands, uh, you know, what's going on, you know, what are the intricacies of, of uh, you know, uh, farming, you know, financial requirements, etc. So um, there are uh, a number of variables that one has to consider. Uh, of course, you know, the criticisms about, you know, political appointees. Yes, you know, some people who would have been affiliated to political parties get, get appointed, but that's fine. I mean, as long as uh, once they are appointed, uh, they, they don't uh, represent a party there. They represent the government. They represent the board. Uh, there are some instances where people who get nominated by uh, political parties or, or suggested by political parties uh, begin to behave that you know they are there to represent a particular political party. Uh, not, not. Uh, I haven't seen any uh, examples of that because the understanding is that when you are appointed, you are appointed to serve the board, to serve the country. You, you know, you are not. It's like when a three-party coalition. The government is a three-party coalition. It's a government for the country. When we are in cabinet, we don't go there to represent uh, NFP or Sodelpa or PA. Mm. The party has elected a prime minister. He chairs the cabinet. He is the prime minister of the country. So that's how, uh, and people have to understand that, mm. that uh, this is a three-party government. It's like a, a three-party government in New Zealand now. Mm. Now once the government is formed, it's a government for the country. And that's how we, 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 uh, we are running. There are things that we may not agree uh, on, on policies all the time, but once a decision is made, it's a government decision. Mm. Uh, there have been accusations that you have appointed friends to boards. Give me uh, one example. Uh, 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 Adish Naidu's name came up, uh, yeah. Atra Singh's name came up. Yeah. Uh, I know yeah. they are party, your party members. Yeah. Uh, how do you respond to that? Attar Singh is a, a trade unionist. Attar Singh, see, the previous government had changed the act to remove the employer and employee representatives. So one of the things that we had promised was that we will immediately uh, try and bring some representation of the workers. And Attar Singh w was endorsed by the Fiji Trade Union Congress. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, to be a member on FNPF board. And uh, Attar Singh uh, is a very qualified, experienced trade unionist who will represent the interest of the uh, workers. He's a very ethical man, somebody who knows, uh, you know, where the interest of the workers lie. And so, as a government, you know, we've appointed him based on uh, his uh, union experience. Mm. Uh, Adish Naidu, uh, is he my friend? <laughs> uh, Adish Naidu uh, was on the board, on, on various, appointed by the previous government too. In fact, he was an administrator, b appointed by the Fiji First Government. So you, you, you can say that he was uh, Ayaz Sayyid Kayum's friend, mm -hmm. or uh, Frank Baini Marama's friend, when he was appointed in, in some of those boards. So you might say that we appointed a, a, a friend of some of the Fiji First Ministers. Uh, so this is the kind of mischief that uh, those who want to make will make. But I am very clear. Uh, he's a very qualified uh, man, probably one of the uh, best architects in the country. He's the president of the Architect Association. And FNPF board would be saved very well to have because FNP have undertakes a lot of, uh, you know, real estate, property management, huge investment there. So he is a very qualified man. Mm. On the issue of the chairperson of, of Fiji National Provident Fund, Dakshas Patel, you have publicly said that you have confidence in him. But the argument is there that uh, you are not firing him or removing him because he's the son of a NFP stalwart, not Patel. Well, Dakshas Patel was appointed by uh, Ayaz Sayed Kayyum, uh, the Fiji First Government, uh, despite the fact that uh, he was a son of Binod Patel. 
so what does that say? I uh, consider him to be a very competent, um, you know, man. Is uh, a is a qualified man, uh, very good qualifications. Uh, he is a CEO of a major uh, company, um, and uh, the work that he has done, uh, that I've seen for one year, uh, is is uh, fantastic. So mm -hmm. I go on merit. You, you, you might want to ask, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if people are appointed, um, they are appointed based on merit. So I know some people don't like him uh, who might say this, but for me, it was the competency. I would rather have somebody who is 80% loyal to the government or 50% loyal to the government but 100% competent. Competency in the job is the most important criteria. Mm. We, may not, we, we may not be able to do that all the time, but for me, as Minister of Finance, competency is, is very, very important. Because if you don't put competent people in a particular position, you'll come back and not only haunt the government, haunt the ministers, but it will be damaging to the country, to the services that people provide. Mm. That's the philosophy I have, and that's what I will practice mm. in government. Is that one of the reasons why the Fiji Revenue and Customs Service doesn't have a CEO currently, and Malakai Nangaya is the executive chairman, that you uh, can't find a competent person? No, the process is already, uh, you know, when, when we appointed him as the chair, again, you know, when I appointed him uh, chair, Somebody said he was uh, your friend. Uh, well, I hadn't I hadn't spoken to him for like three years, um, but he was he was uh, sitting on a number of uh, committees before. But the CEO of FRCS, um, you know, went through a process. We had uh, Mark Dixon. Uh, he left, and the position was advertised. Um, KPMG. Um, and I'm told that the process is about to be completed and a new CEO will be appointed soon. Local, overseas? Well, you know, the board will make the decision. Mm. I can't tell you, you know. Would you want a local or overseas? See, uh, if, if people, when you talk about local and overseas, you've got to make a distinction. See, the government has changed the law now. We want our diaspora to come. Mm. All those people who are descendants of anyone who was a citizen of Fiji during the time of independence or is registered in the Bolani Kaumbula can now, without a Fiji passport, come, live, work, reside here. So when we appoint uh, our, our diaspora, uh, you have to separate you know, overseas or uh, local from uh, that distinction. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you got to... So uh, the board will make that uh, decision. Mm -hmm. Let's talk uh, politics for a while. Uh, in the past year, uh, was there any instance or a time that you thought personally that this is the end of the coalition government? No, never. Uh, in fact, uh, when we, when we uh, got into government, I mean, the, we, we knew that the political mischief, I mean, for example, when the result was being announced, uh, that Sodilpa had decided to support uh, the coalition. I asked Sayyid Kayum when and he did a press conference and said that stones are being thrown at Indo Fijians. Complete lie when people were actually celebrating, people were coming together mm. on the street and celebrating uh, a change of government. And that mischief continued on social media on uh, you know rumors uh, people were telling me that the government will fall during the budget the government didn't fall mm. then they said oh the uh, subtle power will move out and uh, support a board of no confidence that didn't happen we knew inside and the leader of Sodelpa party is a is a is a is a man with absolute integrity and honesty mm. 
I have worked with him. So, the, the, the people in the government were uh, always very clear, the day we formed the government, that this government is going to be, remain a stable, a competent, the government that would complete its term and go into the next election. When you open the newspapers one day and you see on the front page a uh, rift in Sodalpa, rift in People's Alliance Party, uh, how do you re react to that? Well, I think uh, some of this is uh, a bit of media mischief, uh, but, um, uh, you know, misconstruing, you know, what, uh, when, you know, in a coalition, uh, when, when we took a different position on Gaza mm -hmm. and said, the Prime Minister understood that, everybody else, the leader of the Sodalpa party understood that, uh, that doesn't mean that there is a rift. In coalition governments, you look at New Zealand, you look at the coalition governments in Europe, everywhere. The parties can come out and take a different position. But that does not mean that having a policy difference is going to bring down the government. Even in one party governments, you know, in a democracy, unlike the, uh, the, uh, unlike the party that we had here in government, where there was no democracy, but in a, in a democracy, even in a single party, government collapses. There are differences of policy. You know, you have the left and the right. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the Australian Labour Party or New Zealand Labour Party, you have people who, you know, who disagree with policies. And sometimes the governments, their fault because they have a vote of no confidence. They have leadership challenge mm -hmm. among themselves. So these are all normal democratic things that happen. So having a policy difference does not mean that tomorrow uh, Sodelpa party will uh, bring down the government or the NFP will uh, move out of the coalition. That's, that would be a sign of weak and incompetent leaders. And we are not weak and incompetent leaders. We have seen incompetency, dictatorship in the past. We are trying to change that. And all the three leaders, the Prime Minister, myself, and uh, DPM Gaboka, as leader of the Sudulpa Party, we are on the same page. Mm. We can have differences. And if we have differences, we'll sit down and talk. So I want to say to the people, to our investors, to our international partners, all these rumors, all this mischief, mm. uh, you know, from people uh, on social media, about the coalition being unstable uh, is all false, malicious, and mischievous. Mm -hmm. This government was formed on numbers inside Parliament and can go out of power inside Parliament only. Mm -hmm. uh, the public understands that. Yeah. Given the provision of a vote of no confidence, do you think the leader of opposition should accommodate a vote of no confidence if he gets the chance, or should he give this government the four-year term to please uh, serve? Well, that's a question you ask him. Uh, now, what's your thoughts on that? No, I mean, as far as we are concerned, uh, the government uh, is very clear. We have a four-year uh, term, and we're going to finish that four-year term. Mm. And uh, what the leader of the opposition wants to do, uh, it's up to him. You ask him mm. <laughs> what he thinks about it. Is the party, <coughs> NFP party, thinking about 2026 currently? Uh, are you planning for it, or is it too far off? Look, uh, any political party uh, uh, would think about uh, the next election, think about consolidating uh, its party, any political party, whether they are in parliament or outside of parliament. Uh, otherwise, you are not a political party. If you're not thinking about, uh, you know, consolidating your party, improving your party's performance from this election to the next election. That, those are normal things that any political party would do. But we as a government, mm. uh, Anish, when we started, we didn't think about the next election. When we decided to give $50 million to back to school support, $200 each to every student from preschool to from seven for families earning less than 50,000. Mm. We didn't think about the next election. We could have just said, oh, you know, we are in the term early, we'll, we'll do some of these uh, freebies and handouts, uh, you know, towards the end of the election. But we realized that the people needed support. And 
immediately, within a couple of weeks of being in government, we made sure that 227,000 students were paid the $200 each. Mm. Then we have included that $45 million again, next, and the applications are still open. On the 10th of January, we are again going to pay $200 each to all those students who qualify you know, from families below $50,000 income, mm. $200 each. This is not about election. When we increase social welfare, some people actually came and said to me, said, why did you increase the social welfare now? You should have waited uh, next year or following year before the election. Mm. I said, you know, as a government, you know, we are not thinking about the election. My job right now is to manage the economy, make sure that we uh, grow the economy, we earn enough revenue, we look after our people, improve our services. Election is part of the democratic process. And any responsible government will not compromise the interest of the country just because you know you have to own the next and that's what was happening uh, in this country over the last you know uh, eight years because the, every focus was on election mm. so uh, this government will not give freebies come election time we 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 don't i mean y y uh, if you if you talk about increasing social welfare as freebies i don't know if you talk about you know 200 dollar each to support uh, school kids at the beginning of a term of a government that's not freebies I, I don't I don't think you can call it freebies uh, but yes I mean you know so what we are doing is we are going to systematically do things over the next four years if we have to increase the social welfare allowance just the last budget we will do that if we need to pay out uh, additional uh, you know grants uh, additional support to farmers or any stakeholder before the election we will do that but it will be based on the need based on the interest of the country based on the financial position we are not going to be reckless like what we have landed with mm. and if we didn't do what we did in this budget Anish mm. if we didn't set this foundation people would be suffering more people would be suffering more so what we've done is actually in the interest of the country's long-term future. Final question. Given your uh, achievements in the next uh, three years, uh, up till 2026, should you be re-elected, you might get the same position. Are you setting the bar high in 2013 and looking at prime ministership? I'm not thinking about uh, the next election at the moment, Anish. I'm thinking about the next budget. I'm thinking about how we can improve our service. So a couple of things I'm, I'm focusing in 2024. Improving service delivery, getting our new national development plan, making sure that we, we uh, deliver on some of the uh, basic uh, you know, infrastructure such as health, uh, you know, school, we are, we, are, we are looking at, you look at urban schools in, in, in Fiji particularly in Suba, staff student, student ratio. The schools are overflowing. Classrooms are having 50 students. The quality of education in this country, you know, over the last, you know, eight, nine years mm. has just plummeted. So my focus in 2024 is really to look at some of these fundamental problems. I'm not thinking about 2026. We'll talk about that uh, closer to 2026. But do you have the in a uh, want to be leading the country one sometime no i mean the, the see leadership is not about uh, just becoming the prime minister you know i'm a deputy prime minister in a government the minister of finance you know it's a very important position and uh, i am focusing on being a good deputy prime minister and a good finance minister and a good leader of a party mm. in government that's my focus right now if it means other things later on, uh, time will tell. Professor Fassad, thank you very much for speaking with us and all the best in the second year of governance for the coalition government. Thank you. Thank you.